certain things are easy to do in a certain order. Yeah, I can't. I just tried the download and it's working good now. And I had trouble earlier. Oh, great. Okay, welcome to Graphical Debug for Spin 2 with Chip Gracie. I'm little brother Ken. This is the Propeller 2 live forum. And I think we're on our second or third month, eighth or ninth um, presentation here. So what's going on? Uh, before we let Chip roll, um, 26 more Propeller 2 eval boards in stock. <clears throat> and uh, we don't have another build scheduled at the moment. Accessory boards, many of you are waiting for them. They're on back order. However, I just got this picture from our production line. So here they are all ready to go, sitting in trays. Um, just have to be sent through what we call our pizza cutter or panelizer. So give it another day or two. And this is coming in soon. We hope to have this in time built up and assembled and sold by early September. So anybody who's watching Jeff and Michael talk about the propeller tool and wireless programming can do the same with the um, WX module and this little adapter that plugs onto the propeller to evaluation board. So I uh, just wanna draw your attention back to this again, ESP32. Uh, we're keeping the discussion going on this and it looks like we're leaning towards using um, standard firmware in the ESP32 and then just writing a, a super object for the P2 to get started. So that's the, the most functional path of least resistance for the time being, um, just because we're a little bit hesitant of opening the code up in that thing, not knowing where it might take us or where we might take ourselves. Been asking everybody for some applications because we're building a new website. If you've got some Propeller 1 or Propeller 2 products, we, I would love to showcase them and I, I'll share them here as they get shared with me. This is from Henning's Biomedical. And um, briefly what it is, it's done by somebody here on our group. So the, the description is they're seeking FDA approval. The system is a cosmetic device used under the supervision of a doctor. The system uses long wavelength IR to deep heat to human tissue while keeping the skin surface cool and comfortable. The propeller one controls two servos, the infrared lamp, a cooling system, an IR temperature sensor feedback system, ultrasonic sensor for distance, and a touch screen display, and various alarms and temperature settings. <clears throat> so why don't you just lay down under that thing, Johnny Mac? We'll see how you do. And this is what the prototype electronics look like. Um, with the Propeller 1, they're moving to a board, considering the Propeller 2, and there's a display driven by the P1. Pretty cool, huh? No joking, Ken. When I was a kid, I had to have microwave treatments on my knees that immediately <laughs> made me think about that. <laughs> well, hopefully you didn't get overheated. <laughs> um, new objects posted this week. Surprise, surprise. Johnny Mac has given us another object. What is it, John? And it's a pixel driver for the APA 102 C's. Uh, it's a, those are four wire parts. They're much more popular here in Hollyweird because they have a much higher PWM frequency inside the chip. So for movie and video use, they cause less aliasing and, and uh, strobing effects if something is moving very fast through a frame. Um, so there's, um, a couple of movies, I'll have to remember them off the top of my head because they were not memorable movies that used my P1 driver for these chips to light stuff inside robots and things of that nature. So this is the P2 port of that. And again, as I said last week, the P2 assembly is much, much more efficient than the P1 assembly. It's very, very clean and easy. So you recommend these over WS2812s now? Um, they... It, six of one, half dozen the other. They both work really nicely. The, the upshot too with the the um, the APA 102 Cs is they also come in. Uh, you know, there's there's three chips on the LEDs. They come in all white version. So for those of you that have might have seen the TV show called Black Lightning about the uh, uh, superhero guys. There is um, a character on that show called Thunder that has a belt buckle that lights up and does stuff. 
and that's got a propeller mini that is listening to a wireless DMX receiver and then driving the LEDs in the belt buckle. Um, and, and they, uh, so our friend Rick Gallanton and I built that for the TV show. Very cool. So they work, you know, they, so there's, there's options. Right on. Okay, so the click adapter, um, which you've talked about many times, the board somehow took a COVID detour to Japan from Taiwan, but they're supposed to arrive somehow in Rockland pretty soon. And the goal of that, again, is to be able to access some of the, the click boards from um, Micro E. They have thousands of these things, and our customers will be able to get these boards easily from DigiKey or from Mauser. We can't possibly keep up making this kind of stuff, and um, they're doing it already. So this is one I thought was kind of cool. It's a brushless motor controller. Um, so if you have favorite clicks, let us know. I, we're gonna stock like 10 of them just to get going, but uh, it's not really our desire to, to be a distributor of these. Um, we'd rather just have the code for them and get our customers sped towards their, their projects. Coming up um, next week, uh, Chip and John Titus will talk about smart pins. Thanks, Chip and John, for filling the, the void that existed for next week. So that'll be really cool. And then live from Hollywood, Johnny Mac, the king of propellers on August 26th. This is going to be great. Um, lots of signups for this already. People who know John's previous work, um, which is extensive products, stamp works, lots of parallax stuff. And then early September, we have the propeller tool and wireless programming with Jeff and Michael. It's also gonna be neat because we'll learn things about using the propeller tool for Windows that we didn't know. Okay, before we let Chip loose, um, got a, a little video here. We experimented yesterday with his big monitors. He has multiple 4K monitors set up vertically and uh, it seemed like it was easier for him to share the, the desktop rather than share specific parts of an application because we couldn't see how when he would change code, the display would change. So what you can do when he shares out the monster um, is just this. So I'll narrate the video. So you'll see this initially. And if you just go up on top of the Zoom display, when I get there, okay, up to view options, you could set this for something that you like, and I think I'm gonna choose um, 100%. So this lets you zoom, and then you, if he keeps things in the same place on the monster display, it'll work well for you. And then you could use your, your hand to move things around. So hopefully that sounds good for everybody and that works out a little bit better. And we don't have to outsource to Canada for sharing screens and such. So with that, I got to play with this yesterday. This is super cool. Chip, all yours. If anybody wants to um, talk, you're welcome to mute yourself. Um, it's not, Chip doesn't mind the interruption. We might bring him back to topic. And um, you can use the chat for sharing anything you want while we get going here. All right. <clears throat> um, what I'll do is I'll share my screen uh, so we can look at the top of it like Ken was saying. I think it's this screen. There we go. Um, so can you all see, if you can kind of move to the top of the screen, you see the peanut program here. So as Ken said, if you go up to the top and you do the uh, zoom option and set it for 100%, you should be able to navigate kind of the, to the top area of my monitor and you'll see uh, this little, this uh, peanut window. So anyway, <clears throat> if you guys remember from last time, we have this debug stuff in the chip now that enables the uh, P2 to send out like text strings serially that can be caught by a terminal uh, during on debug interrupts. So by putting debug statements into your code, you can cause the emission of these messages. And if you compile for debug, those are included. If you compile without debug, they're excluded. So you don't have to comment them out if you're not doing any debug work. So if you can look at this uh, 
screen up here, you can see a few lines here. I have some debug statements. And uh, the way this whole scheme works is this kind of rides on top of the debug text messaging. So I noticed this backtick character was available. It's usually located up on your keyboard, uh, all the way upper left uh, below the escape key. And it seems to almost never be used. I know it's used in Verilog to trigger certain macro things. So it's, it's kind of an odd character. So what I did is I looked for that in the stream coming in on the debug data. And when I see that, I look for either a name of a type of debug display, which are set in stone, there's several of them, or a name of a debug display. And uh, if I see a, a formal name of a type of display, I know that someone wants to configure a display for, for, for uh, output. So, what you would do is follow that with a name that you give it. It can be anything. Um, you could even play with the debug stuff so that you can give names that are uh, based actually on cog numbers too. You know, you can use these uh, debug expressions to put strings together that uh, the PC, when, the, when it arrives, it will see as like different names. Um, then for each of these types, there are, some, there are some presets and defaults, but you can override the defaults. Like this is a scope display, right? Like the rolling and triggering oscilloscope display. And I call it ZZZ, and I want it to be 400 by 300 pixels. So I override the 256 by 256. I want it to have 200 samples. So it's gonna space samples every other pixel across that 400 uh, width. And then I want the line size, instead of one, I want it to be thick. I want it to be three. So as it draws the traces, it's gonna be thicker. Then down in these lines, I assign my signals. You know, I give them names, oh, excuse me, the first three, not that last one. So these three, I, when, when I give the, the back tick, the name, and then when it sees a string, it knows it, oh, someone wants to give me a channel name and some metrics to go with it. So, and it, and it orders them zero through seven, just in order of appearance. So, the way this thing works, I've, I've put some elaboration down here in this comment section. Uh, when you go to define a, uh, a channel, you've, you can supply these values. There are some defaults, but you probably want to override them all and just put in what you want. So uh, top value is the, the highest value you want to or you anticipate coming in from that channel. Bottom value is the lowest value. Height is how high you want it to be on the screen in pixels. Offset Y is how high you want it to be up from the bottom. And then there are these grid settings, which I need to document. The four LSBs of that value will determine what kind of grid lines you have associated with that, um, with that channel and also um, whether or not you want the values for those grid lines printed. And then here, you can override, the, there's a default color sequence for channels that can be overridden as the last term here. You probably don't really care about that, but anyway, then uh, the next thing I do here is after I assign the three channels, so if you look here, like for example, cosine and sine, I'm saying that they range from minus 128 to 128, and they're gonna be 65 pixels tall on the screen, and I want uh, the first one elevated 32 from the bottom, or excuse me, 128 from the bottom, and the next one elevated 32, and then I have all four LSBs turned on for these 15 to, to enable both grid lines and values. Then lastly here, I set up a trigger. And so I say uh, this, this trigger is a keyword, right? So I give the back tick name trigger, the channel number, I want channel two, and when it first crosses third 20, Whoops, I give two values, 20 and 30. So these are like arm and, arm and fire values. So the first is it wants to see 20 be crossed and then 30 be crossed. So that sets up a positive slope trigger, right? It has to go to 20, then it has to hit 30 or, or go below 20 and above 30. And then I want to go back 200 or 100 samples into my sample lot. And remember up here, we have 200 samples. So that's gonna put the trigger point right in the middle of the display. So when I run this thing, 
this is the part here that actually feeds the data. It's going to feed uh, two cosines of different frequencies and then a, a, a sawtooth because this I value here just increments. And then here I end it with 63 to get a, a zero to three F hex thing that just loops. And I put a little pause here so it doesn't run too fast and then outstrip the ability of the PC to capture and process this. So when I do a control F10, now we can see here, I'm gonna do something. When it says repeat, I'm gonna put like 10 here. I'm gonna just have it emit a very little bit of data at first. So you can see here what came out in the debug stream is the scope, then the name, and then my metrics, and then my three channels and my trigger setup. And then after that, you just see all these three values that repeat. And so those are then feeding the scope. And I could also, uh, there are some other commands down here that you, you could use, but we're not doing that right now. So let me take this repeat back off and just let it run full blast. And so you can see here that we set the trigger up on channel two, which is, uh, Z, this is channel zero, one, two. So the sawtooth is the trigger. And uh, so when it, go, when it goes below 20 and above 30, it triggers. And it's capturing data for the other channels as well. And um, so you can see how this works. If I want to change the trigger around, let's say I want to trigger on channel one, which is the sign, you can change at F10. And now the, uh, the sign is stable, and then the others are, are, are rolling. And I can also, of course, just trigger on the green, which is the co well, what I've called cosine. You can see the other signals rolling by. Now, if I don't want to do any triggering, I could just get rid of this debug statement here. And if I just run like that, it's just showing me a rolling display of data. You can see sometimes how there's a little error. It's because it's, uh, it's not able to keep up with the data coming in. So for something like this, if I, if I put, uh, let's see, I have to hold reset to stop the data. So if I put a wait five here, that should be sufficient. Chip yeah, got I'm, a question from JMG. Yep. The text says top value, bottom value, but the examples show minus 128, positive 128. Is one of those backwards? Seems oh, 120 okay, minus yeah. 128 is the bottom value. Actually, the way I wrote the code is, it, you can swap the top and bottom value places. I'll explain, I'll, I'll, I'll make note of that, but it just wants to know what the extrema are. And then it looks at who's higher than who, and it orders them properly at runtime. So uh, you just have to put the two extrema values in there. It doesn't matter what order they're in. Yeah, good catch. Now let's see, we have another display. So that's the uh, scope display. Uh, we also have a, uh, let's see, a scope XY. We also, so the scope XY, I'll run this. Um, this is a little different. This uses an X and Y coordinate pair. So you can see, if I stop this debug output, you can see here, there are four values being spit out, right? And so it's an X0, Y0, X1, Y1. And as many data sets as you hand it, it automatically opens up new channels and displays them. Um, so I'll let this thing run. Now what this is doing over here, I have, can you still see my camera at all? All right, you'll need to, sh you'll need to share it as well. Okay, so let's see, uh, new share. Uh, let's see, how do I stop? So if sharing? you wanna show the camera side by side with there all of go. this. Okay, okay, you don't have to choose, good. All right, so I've got two Gortzel boards connected to this, right? This is gonna be Gortzel one and this is Gortzel two. And these have just recently been redesigned. They're gonna be a lot better next version because we found that putting the sensor pad on the backside and making it smaller and then just putting very thin annular output rings works much better. That way your finger's coupling through the FR4 to that center pad and it gets rid of a lot of the persnickety behavior because of over coupling when you're just going through a solder mask. So anyway, we've got here two Gortzel boards. So I'll put this back. 
Um, now I'm going to go back to the screen share. Let's see here. Okay, so you should be seeing this display again. So here we have the data coming out, and you can see here um, we have this XY display with two labeled signals. So as I move my fingers around on this, it's tracking. There's one channel, and then I can concurrently, you know, move my finger on the other channel. So we can do every one of these scope displays can handle up to eight channels of data. All you do is just feed it the data, and it'll automatically uh, assign and, and uh, you know display whatever's coming in. So once these things are configured, you can see it takes very minimal data to feed these things. So that's the XY. Now there's a there's a thing about the XY display. And the, and the row theta display, which are the same things, but the XY display, you give it an XY coordinate pair, the RT, the row theta, you give it a, a, like a length and an angle. And uh, otherwise they look the same, but they take a different type of data. So I'm gonna go add to this thing, by the way here, let's see, I'll show you how this is configured. You can Chef see this. Francis thing. also asked, can you display the data with persistence? Uh, you mean like, so it never goes away? I think that's what he means, yeah. Yeah, if, if I go sample, so I have a sample set here to 100. If I go to uh, zero, now it never loses anything. So you have zero is, you know, persistence that never ends. And then one through 511 or 512 is a trail that dissipates as you move along. So like if I set this to just 10, well, if I set it to one, we're not gonna have any persistence, right? It's just, you know, wherever I put these dots, that's where they are. If I put it to, uh, you know, 10, we'll get a little bit. Whoops. Oh, I don't know if that's going to come through on the uh, on the you know zoom, but and we could we could I put quite it. a quite a long guy if I put three hundred. Now we have like quite a long trail that dissipates very slowly. So you can set that up. Now there's a thing. There's an option for this. Um, if, we, if we throw the word in here, log scale, what it does is it applies like log, logarithmic dilation uh, to the uh, data effectively on the, uh, on the row or, or the, the length. So it becomes very, very sensitive like in the middle. You can almost see, you can kind of see that pattern the way those things are. So what happens is out at the extrema here, it takes much more excursion to move than it does in the middle. The middle is very sensitive. And if I move my pointer in there, I can see that, you know, here we are, X is uh, one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. see it starts to move exponentially higher so that, you know, by the time we get out to here, we're all the way to 2000. So this is really helpful when you're looking at uh, signals that maybe you don't know a lot about yet and you just want to be able to get kind of a lay of the land you can you'll you'll see everything you know it won't just stick the details in the center and, and squash them so you can't see them the small details will be brought out so they have some excursion on the display and then meanwhile things get compressed as you get to the outside and so that log scale works for both the uh, xy scope and the uh, rho theta scope Okay, so the way this thing was set up here, and now this one, this one's working from assembly language, right? So I uh, set it up. I'm saying I want it to be 200 pixels in radius. I want that radius range to be 2000. So that's a, a, like a numerical value of 2000 will take it out to the, uh, to the outer, outer, you know, radius. And then I want, you know, persistence of 300. I want 
dot size of three, log scale. And then I here I, I hand it my, uh, my label names, Gortzel 1 and Gortzel 2. Thereafter, now I've called this thing XY, right? So thereafter, I just say backtick XY and then do this debug command that spits out uh, four long starting at hub address zero. And uh, it prints them in sign decimal, which is going to be textually the shortest, which is what we want. And then here I wait for like uh, a hundredth of a second, 10 milliseconds, and I loop back. And meanwhile, I have this, these two, pro, well, two instances of this one program running in two co one cog each. And uh, each cog does the variation on pins. And then one guy reports to long offset zero one, the other guy reports to two and three. So that the other cog that's picking it up and doing the display, because you can't really have, you don't have the time to spit that text message out in the middle of this tight Wurzel thing. There's really no time. So I just report to hub memory and then use this command to spit out that data and then do a delay and loop back. Chip, somehow I missed it. What was the purpose of the label Gortzel 1 and Gortzel 2? Is that just to display on the screen? Yeah, just so you know that the first channel, the green, see they're color coded, right? The green is Gortzel 1, and then the red is Gortzel 2. So it's kind of a color key. So you, it's like your color legend, so you know what to look at on the display. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And there's an automatic color sequence. You can override it, but there's an automatic sequence of color assignments that go through different channels. Um, anyway, so that's the that's the uh, row theta display or the, the XY display. This is kind of dear to my heart because I've always wanted to do like a lot of signal stuff and circular functions are where it's all at. So this display is really good for uh, observing you know, cyclical phenomena that involves circles and things, and rotations. Okay, so I'll move on. We have, um, let's see, let me open another file here. We have a, a plotter, right? By the way, let me, let me first just open up another thing. I have a file here. I put these all into the latest uh, upload. So this is kind of a, a like a legend for what 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 commands the different things take, right? So we've seen the scope. That was the first thing we saw, right? These are all the uh, commands, and here are the defaults, right? You can override them. Um, here's how you feed it data, you know, down here. Then this, then after that is the uh, definition for how the scope x y works, right here. And then we have two other things. We have a plotter and a terminal. So the plotter, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can, you can draw lines, uh, plot points, draw rectangles, ellipses, uh, any number of sided polygons. You can draw them as frames or filled. You can control the outline thickness and color and the center color. Uh, you can do text with all kinds of different justifications and uh, bold, italic, underline, strike out, and uh, any, any size you want and color. And uh, you can control the background color. And in, in every single one of these modes, there's, you, you can do this thing when you, when you set up the channel, you can, you can use this word update. And what that's going to do is it's not going to automatically update the display every time you give it data. So what it allows you to do is like do a clear as you're running, clear that clear your bitmap, and all this stuff's actually triple buffered. There's two bu two bitmaps I maintain before it gets to the canvas on the window. That's how it had to work in order to not have any flicker. Um, but what you can do is you can do a clear, you can draw an entire scene, and then do an update. Whoops, now the update will be right here. And at that point, it will transfer it to your window. So you get completely flicker-free displays. And you can use the plotter to do anything, really. You, you can draw anything you want with the plotter. Um, but it's not, I mean, the other modes are more suited to data. I mean, you can see that, like this X, 
XY scope is only taking, you know, four numbers in and it knows what to do with that data. You don't have to give it any specific commands because it's very modal. But anyway, the plotter can be used to draw anything. And after that, we have a terminal. And the terminal is just like a mini terminal. You can set uh, the columns and rows, the text size, text color, background color. Um, you have four different color schemes you can switch between. So it uses then just, you know, values, zero, one, two, three. These will actually switch uh, modes and, and allow you to home the cursor, position the X and Y. You can also give it strings all at once. Uh, and then it has the clear and update thing as well. Also, all these modes have a save command during feeding. So you can give it a save command and it will uh, write that to a, a bitmap file. So if it's something you want, you know when you want it, you can uh, put that in a debug statement and it'll save it off to your current directory as a bitmap. All right, so I'm gonna load the plotter. I just made a simple little plot program. I didn't have time today because I was working on the uh, application right up to the last minute. Uh, so debug plot. Okay, so this is a very simple little program. Let me make it bigger. Uh, here we set, we say we want a plotter. We're gonna call it my plot. And then we're gonna put it in up, actually, yeah, we put it in update mode. Okay, so that means we're gonna clear it, draw it, and then update it. We're gonna get Flickr free output. So then as a command, I say backtick my plot, that's the name. And now you can figure that you can bury these things deep inside objects, right? And so you can have debug stuff in objects that opens these windows and there's no limit. I think I have it limited to 16, but you can throw up 16 instances of any combination of these types of displays that you want and then feed them all concurrently. So here I'm gonna say, I wanna clear it. I wanna draw a polygon. And then I wanna put some text up. I'm gonna print a number. Or no, wait, no, 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 text. It's, it's this number here provides the Y coordinate for the, for the uh, number and it all comes out of the text. And then I'll print boom and then I'll update that, right? So when I run this, you can see that thing's animating, right? And it, and it stops up there. But this could be used to do all kinds of display. It's just going to be slow because it's kind of verbose. So that's the that's kind of a simple, simplistic the plotter. Now the last thing is the terminal. So uh, the terminal here, I'm saying uh, I want to call it temp. I want it to be 11 rows by one column, and I want big text. And then I'm gonna feed it, uh, here I'm saying temp, that's the name of it, clear. Actually, we don't even really, uh... oh yeah, so that's gonna home the cursor and clear the screen. Then I'm going to print out temp equals, and then I'm gonna print uh, a number using the debug stuff, and then I'm gonna put an end quote. So the, the uh, terminal is gonna see that whole thing as a string, so it's gonna be able to print it easily. It's going to wait a tenth of a second, then it's going to loop. So when I run this thing, you can see it's just counting. So you could just, if there's a couple variables of interest that you wanted to look at, you could actually start up a little terminal and just feed it that data. Got a question, Chip? Yeah. Um, instead of using debug, can we configure serial routines to do this? Like, say, from a propeller one? Uh, let's see. Can't, okay, yes, yes. Uh, I put a special thing in here, right? So this is the menu. See this debug toggle? When I, when I uh, toggle that off and on, you have to have the COM port set up to whatever the COM port is, but it, it opens up the debug window. Now I have programmed into my board some program, right? So I'm gonna reset it. There, that's what was programmed into my board. So yes, you can use Peanut and then later the propeller tool, which will have this integrated. You can use this to just do a generic display. So if you can kind of spoof all these, all these serial commands, you can drive this thing to generate different display types and open windows and feed them data. So it could be used for anything. And I've been thinking about do this thing since we made the SX tool back in 96, I was thinking forever, it would be great to have something like this that just, uh, you know, allows you to visualize data through 
terse data fed into it. So you feed it some configuration data, then thereafter you just give it, you know, channel data and it knows what to do with it and how to display it. And so this does have universal use. You could use it for anything. Um, you could use the peanut program now and soon this will be integrated into the propeller tool. Let me run this thing again. So here's, here's this. So let's see if I, I'm gonna stop this uh, just to review here. There, so here this is, you can see this output now. It shows that COG0 booted, then COG0 started the spin interpreter, and then this message was sent out. Term, temp, size 11, one, 11 by one, text size 40, and then thereafter, I just talk to it, I say back tick, the name of it, temp, clear it, and then uh, give it a string which I composed, uh, you know, kind of dy dynamically on the fly, but when it comes out in the debug data, it's all, you know, static. So if you can, if you can just generate the backtick commands with anything that outputs serial, you could utilize all this stuff. And this thing can grow. Now that I've got it working, I got to put in some bit mode so that we can see some uh, bit waveform so that if you give it like a 32-bit value, it can draw 32 waveforms across and then, uh, you know, maybe trigger on certain patterns. There's all kinds of stuff we can do. We can do bar graphs, we can do pie charts, and it's all, it's all live. But now that we've got this thing in place, it's going to be very easy to augment. All right, so that's basically my uh, presentation on all this. And this has been uploaded uh, on that peanut spin to latest version thread on the forum. Uh, you can download it and all these programs that I've used as examples are in there. So we got some questions, Chip. Um, so what language is it written in? Could it be open source so it could be compiled on other platforms? It's written in Delphi, which is Pascal and for Windows. Uh, in fact, here's, here's the code. I mean, let's see, this is, uh, this is the code for it. This whole thing right now, there's one other module, but it's like uh, 1,445 lines. It's not that big, and this does all those different displays. I mean, this could be recreated for any other platform. There's really not that much to it. It's basically just, you know, oh, there, there's a little more. Inside my compiler, there's a parser that actually goes through that string and parses out the values, because I didn't want to do that in Pascal. I figured it might be kind of slow, and. I already had all those resources in my compiler, like hash symbol tables. So I used my compiler uh, to do the parsing. You know, so as it gets the text screen, text string, it breaks it apart by type and value. And then that's what this program uses. It just indexes through those types and, and values and then uh, uses that higher level data. But it, it, it's not that complicated. Chip, question from Eric Smith. If the compiler is doing the parser, then how can we do this on a P1? Okay, well, you see, all that matters is that you output those text strings that, that, that this thing wants to see. How you compose them, I mean, the reason I have the parser there is because I have all these debug commands that, that, that do different things. And, um, so I needed uh, I needed some parsing ability, but if but if you don't care about resolving you know runtime expressions and all that, uh, or you know just simply having a value printer uh, that can send out a decimal number, that's that's all you need. But to work to integrate it into the spin, I kind of used the resources I had in the compiler. Now I've talked a lot. I hope it made sense and that it was absorbable. Do you guys feel like this makes sense to you? You understand what it's doing? Free for all, questions, comments. Yeah, can I, can I jump in here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 
Okay, so this is sort of exactly what I need. I don't know if my screen sharing is working, but I have a very similar application that's like 18,000 lines of C, but I have not solved the, 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 at the PC side to uh, spin side interface. So that's the big piece of the missing puzzle that we need as a DLL so that people that are, that are doing DSP work or interfacing, there's two missing pieces. One is what I think you just solved, and, and it would be heavenly to have USB 2.0 or FireWire. So now you're getting me motivated where I want to work on FireWire. Can I jump in here with screen sharing and show you how I'm doing something very similar in C on the PC side, even though I'm not talking to the propeller, what I'm doing with my DSP tool chain? Can I like just jump in? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to hit share screen, so let's see if it works. Okay, is that going to come up? Yeah. Okay, I hit, I, hit, I hit share, and now I have my screen. Okay, can you see this okay? Like I have yeah. some kind of oscilloscope here. Is this coming up? Yes. Okay, you're seeing my oscilloscope, and you're not just seeing my picture of my propeller, right? You're seeing right, yeah, we see your screen. Okay. All right, so there's an oscilloscope, okay? I'm going to hit stop. I'm going to go to new window, and I'm going to pick something like... Um, uh, Fourier linear. Oh, we crashed. Hold on, let me reboot. All right, that's, I'm going to restart. Let me restart. That's because I can't have the oscilloscope running at the same time as the spectrum analyzer because they're in a war with each other. They're over the size of a buffer. So we'll just restart. It won't crash this time. So you wrote this app, is that right? Yes, yes. It's about 18,000, between 18 and 30,000 lines of raw C, and it's been working on it for like 20 years. So I'm just going to go right into Fourier Interpolated, load the wave, and I'm going to show you something. This is what I was using when I was posting to um, 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 the uh, ADC breakthrough thread. There we go. Okay, and this is Bohemian Rhapsody. This is a spectrum analyzer. And this is the direction where I'm going with this. Okay, I hope I don't crash yeah, it again. If we, get the, if we can get high enough data rates, we could do a lot more stuff than what I'm showing. Yeah. So like I'm gonna show you something here. If I rewind this Bohemian Rhapsody, rewind, I can hit play. Now, right here, do you see where my mouse is? Yep. This is a CD rip. Apparently, the CD has um, second harmonic of the British power line frequency at approximately minus 64 dB. Uh. FFT is very, very sensitive. You can do amazing things, right? Right. This here, over here, this is the quartet. These are the notes they're singing. D, this here, C, C sharp, D, E, F, F sharp, G, A, B, C, right? I can go to new window and I can bring up something like um, a house and I can switch to um, OpenGL, okay? I have a partially implemented and then I'll tile them and I'll get rid of that and bring something else up like a 32 channel oscilloscope, right? But if I want a different number of channels, I can go to um, FFT signal processing. I'm not going to change because I don't want to crash things. Once I create a filter tree, I have to reload and relaunch the app. Okay, but suppose I want a different FFT size. You know, I can change it. Suppose I want 16 subbands or I want 512 subbands. I can change my number of channels. I have different things. I don't have comb filtering implemented yet, but I've got a lot of split and merge operations and doing things. So we're going to look at this here real quick. And this is where I, what I need bandwidth. And it's like, what you're seeing on this 32 channel side is very similar to the way that MP3 does it. Um, taking audio, splitting it into doing a Fourier transform like a 8,000 point FFT, take that, turn that back into 32 separate time domain channels. And let me go somewhere, not to um, propeller test, but uh, let's go with replace with test stone. 
Yay, we didn't crash. Let's pick a sine wave starting at 27 hertz, ending at that. Click OK, hit rewind, and now I'm going to do a sweep. And we're just going to watch this walk up the, um, um, and I don't know if you can hear it. Wait, you're really quiet now. Okay, all right. So what I'm doing is I'm walking the sine wave up, and each time the uh, signal crosses over into a different subband, so it's sort of like a crossover, bass, mid-range, and treble coming out three different things. I'm actually implementing, I've partially implemented a polyphase filter tree from scratch, but I don't have full, um, you know, like in, the way MP3 or Dolby AC3 has done it yet. I want to be able to do that with the propeller being part of something like a DJ controller and at the same time be able to have the, um, uh, you know, all the DSP stuff on the PC side because I have stuff. And then, then you've got this stuff. Now you've got this XY mode and you've got some other things that are going on with the Gertzel. And I think what uh, you're, you know, you're saying is when you say 14, 1,440 lines of Delphi, I could port that to C in a weekend. And the hard part is still figuring out the protocol that the propeller is using to add and tear down channels. When somebody says, well, I, want, I only need 37 channels or I want 17 channels and, and different bandwidth rates without like doing a TCP stack where you, we can't be sending, you know, uh, 100 bytes of, of uh, TCP IP overhead back and forth, um, you know, to send one byte of data. Okay, so if you've solved something that is just absolutely huge where it's like, I can write a DLL with that and link it into what I have. And that's, and then the big, the other remaining big piece is the bandwidth problem to, to really have a, uh, a hardcore, um, um, a DSP tool chain. Uh, any, any questions or something, or should I just you know stop sharing the screen now? Okay. But what do you have questions for me? Because you know what I you know what I need. I need C source and spin source so I can be talking to the propeller and not just running simulations. You know when I like go into something like um, you know the code that. Um, where are we? Uh, you know, there's like some propeller test code that was like. This stuff. This goes. This goes back to the uh, Sigma Delta ADC breakthrough days, where there, you know, we have, we have some of. Uh, that's not what I want. I want that one. There we go. That's the Sigma Delta stuff back from bitstream testing, right? And uh, going all the way back to ADC break breakthrough and the 50 pages of stuff. Uh, and does anybody have a question for me? You know what? I think I think I've stated what I where I what I need and the direction I'm going. Okay. So, I'll so stop my, huh? I'm okay. What you're interested in doing is taking like you want to set up some kinds of displays dynamically and then feed them data, right? Correct. And on the PC side, I have the ability to just say, let's have a new window, and I want a, um, a FFT Fourier transform. Um, uh, subsample buffer, okay, or something like that, and and that's the subsample buffer for the, uh, you know, that's the way you, that's the way people usually do FFT stuff. And then I go over here, and uh, if I go to something like uh, the piano display, which is not broke, which is not working right now, um, but the idea is to be able to like feed audio in, and since the uh, pitch oh, what, work, what keys. Yeah, like audio in sheet music out type stuff, music transcription. And it's very, very doable on the P2, right? And you get around a big problem that the PC has with like two seconds of latency, uh, sometimes with a lot of like uh, spectrum analyzer apps because of the, the bottleneck in getting from all the windows overhead. When we're real time and, re and, and have millisecond response times, 
and the video is being generated by the propeller and there's this little device that somebody can like plug into a VGA monitor and have audio in and they sit down, they play their piano and say, oh, what note is that? What note are they singing? Is that like C? Is that, is oh, that? yeah, 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 yeah. That's the kind of thing that I'm interested in too. Now, you know what we're doing now is we're just generating, we have some data on the chip and we're sending it out serially. The PC is completely slowly handling the data stream and putting up windows and overriding bitmaps and updating them to make all these displays. But it's so that the P2 could actually receive that data and, and much more handily process it and display it in a timely manner. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, without, uh, yeah, because these latencies are a killer, you know, it's hard to get away from latencies. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. And I can, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and close this out now and stop my screen sharing. Okay, since there we go, I'm back to my, uh, you know, my my background. Yeah, that's what we want to do. I, I'm thinking, you know, if I can get the source code for this thing, you say it's in Delphi. I can I might be able to port that to, to C in a weekend and have a DLL, you know, because that that's a the the big hurdle is the serial protocol that the PC is using to talk to the uh, uh, the propeller so that people that are want to work in spin or people that want to work in one of the other tool chains so that everybody can work in the tool chain of their choice and we can all be debugging and doing things and then eventually doing it all where we're going to be self-hosting but uh, yeah um, I'm, I might get motivated to start if I really just stick my foot in my mouth and commit to something to look into implementing firewire because we should be able to do 100 megabit firewire right 100, firewire like my my camcorder that i'm using that actually only puts out 100 megabit even though it's a, a 400 megabit protocol because when firewire was invented it was only 100 megabit so it's like usb which is one megabit or 12 megabit or something it has different tiers we should be able to support the low level tier but i don't know how big the stack is going to be but it's definitely well worth working into now that we have something that can add and tear down channels dynamically, which is something that Firewire does really well. Okay, that's it. Okay, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that's uh, that that's not seen, and let me show. I could show it to you. Uh, let me pull up. Uh, let's see. Where did I stick this thing? Uh, debug. Let me see if I can find it. Let's see. Oh, here we are. Okay, so I've got a couple hundred lines. Mm, let's see, 586. About 400 lines of assembly that, a, a 386 code that, you know, does the parsing. But that parsing could be done in a high level language too. There's really not that much to it. All you're doing is you're upper casing stuff and then looking for matches against known keywords and names that the user has defined. And then you're taking, uh, like if you see a dollar sign, you know you got a hex, digit, a hex number coming, so ignore any uh, underscores, uh, you know, that might be in there, spacers. And all things like um, spaces, tabs, commas, that's all white space. It's only looking for keywords and numbers. That's all, it's, that's all it knows. And then single quotes to define strings. There's really not that much going on at all. Chip, do you have any other kinds of displays planned? Uh, like I said, a digital one where we can look at bits. That's kind of obvious. And then um, I think a bar graph thing would be good. But I mean, what we have is actually very flexible. Say you wanted to do like a, 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 a spectrum analyzer sweep, right? You could use the scope for that. You just, uh, you know, feed it, put it in update mode, set the sample size to however many bins you have, feed it those bins and then say update. And it would just, boop, there's your, you know, there's your spectrum, spectral display. And then feed it another set of data and boop, there it is again. So what we have is useful for a lot of, it can be repurposed for a lot of different things. But uh, you know, you guys have good imaginations. Maybe I'm open for ideas. 
You know, I really wanted to get the XY display. That's what I've been thinking about forever with that logarithmic dilation because that's really useful. It kind of opens things up. And then uh, we could do, so we could do things like spectrum analyzers. The trouble is that's better done on the chip where it probably matters. And then simply output the results to the scope display or something. Chip, I'd much rather see all of this happening on a, on a P2, on a standalone P2. So just link um, a serial link to a second P2. And on the P2, you'd have a VGA connector, maybe a USB for a keyboard, and you'd just be driving VGA in, nine, in 1080p. Yeah. That, well, we'd, we'd have to have some bigger RAM. I think we'd need some, you know, to do a 1080p display with, you know, 24-bit color, it's going to take uh, more data than we have in the chip, right? Otherwise, we're going to become very constrained on the colors. Yeah, but you don't have to display, although you've got, you're driving a 1080 screen, you don't have to drive it. it, it the whole lot of the screen doesn't have to be in 1080. Uh, some of it can be text. Um, yeah. Some of it doesn't have to be the color depth that you need. So there's all sorts of things you can manipulate. And if it's in a prop, we can manipulate it ourselves without having to worry about windows getting in, in the road of everything. We've got total control. We haven't got to worry about virus detection, all the rest of it. Yeah, no, the, it's looking more appealing every day. It seems like the PC is becoming kind of like... Uh, like some military checkpoint or something, you know, who wants to live like that? We might have to just build the ark and go off on that. I kind of am enthused about that. All I need is enough impetus and I'll do it. I don't want to, I want to do it eventually anyway, but if it were to be hastened, I wouldn't complain. Yeah, well do, do what you're doing, but do it on the, do it on the P2 with a second, second pair of lines. Yeah. Yeah, it could be done. The PC is kind of nice that it has a lot of memory and a lot of resources that you can really just kind of abuse without concern for, you know, like you can just save a 24-bit bitmap. Who cares, you know? You can then import it into something else. So the PC is good for like big stuff, but it is kind of slow. I mean, we are having trouble you know, keeping up with it. If we if we had it all on the chip, we wouldn't have to serialize the data and then interpret it. We could just go right for the guts, you know? We could just display exactly. stuff straight away, which would be huh, a hundred, hundreds of times faster. And then you've created something that, that's a product as well for other systems. Yeah, you know, I, I wonder, um, it seems to me, I see, feel like I'm kind of out of touch, like, what seems to be important to people, I don't really relate to. Like, I think stuff like that would be useful, but I, but to me, it seems like modern engineers would say, well, um, I just want it to, um, I want it to be able to be in like something like a flash or something so that I can, I can slap it onto web pages and view it remotely. And I know there's utility in that, but I think in order to get uh, really down, and dirty with what you're working on, you have you have to have higher bandwidth connections that are simpler. You know, you're not all this everything through the internet kind of stuff. But I'd be quite happy just working on what you're talking about. I just wonder if it would have really application to me and my sensibilities. It's what's needed, but I don't understand the world anymore. I've been holed up on this thing for so long, and I I don't know you know, what, what common expectations and needs are. I think what would be very helpful is really to have a P2 with HyperRAM, right. driver, which can do text areas too, and then use that as display for your D-book. Yep. Yeah, that could work. It would be really neat to have nice, high-res data displays that are very fast with no late, no discernible latency, because there's nothing that does that today. Like uh, Gorman was saying, I think that's his name, that, you know, he, he there's like up to two second delays. You just can't get around on the PC platform. And for a lot of stuff, it renders it just worthless. 
you know, the, the whole feedback loop for your, everything that you want to do is just broken. And so you're always looking through some kind of time warp and everything. And it would be nice to have stuff that's super responsive. Yeah, but with, with that hyper rem, you can get out of the, the hub rem problem, basically. And this have the video display in the hyper rem. Roger can do that almost, I think, the last time I read. So basically, yeah. you have a fast display and still most of the P2 empty. You're going to find that hyper rem is not going to do what you want because you've got to be able to write to it and update it at the same time as you're reading back from it. Hyperam is not the solution. You've got too much overhead. If you want anything, you've got to use static RAM. That's the you only know, way you're going to get speed. Well, there's, there's SD RAM. We, we were using that on P2Hot pretty well, but it takes a lot more pins. Is Roglo on here today? Or Roger? Because he's the guy that was working on the hyperam, right? Or was that Osprop dad? I think it was Roglo, right? Yeah. I don't know. Let's see. Roger, but, I'm going to look at the list here. It's Roger. Roger Lowe. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be on. But even with the 512K, you, you would be surprised how much you'll get on there. And we can yeah. worry about extra RAM later, but let, let's, let's get the basis there and see what's necessary. I think you'll find that there's a, you'll get a lot of stuff in the, in the, five, in the 512K. Yeah, there, there's, there's like two megapixels uh, on that uh, 1080p display, right? And, yeah. Um, but you're not gonna display it all as pixels. You're gonna have some that's text. And right. when it's text, it doesn't need the, the big buffer. Um, yeah. You only need a section of it to be a, a proper scope display. You don't need the whole 1080p to be a, a scope display. You just need a small section. Right. Yeah. If we were full bitmap to 1080p, we'd only be able to do about two bits per pixel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, did, I did some mucking around before the chip came, uh, before, back on the, on the Rev A chip. And I had 1080p running on it and I had mixes of text and little graphs and all the rest of it. And you'd be surprised what you can do with just a, a small font in there that's specific for drawing things. Right. So there's right. All, all sorts of windows within there. You don't need the whole lot to be the, the 1080, 1920 by 1080. You only need a section of it to be a scope type mode. And there you can get away with less colors. And you can flip as you're displaying it, you can flip sections of it into different colors. Right. So if, you, if you're doing a digital, um, you're looking at inputs, you, the first line can be one, one color foreground and back, background and that's only that's only one bit right information so you can do one bit pixels but yet you you've got a foreground the background color and you flip right. it as you as you display a group of lines you flip the the um what are pixel. your color keys yeah right yeah no i, I could see that what would be neat though is like what what uh, Gerald Gorman was showing where he's got like really rich color and all kinds of, you know, neat like spectral analyses and things like that. That really requires high color to do. And it would be neat if we could do that too. Plotting lines is pretty straightforward, but showing what amounts to kind of 3D data in the sense that you've got X and Y and then color and brightness, uh, that just needs more color depth. And, but it would be really nice to have that. And I think we, we're going to need more RAM to be able to do that. But I know what you're saying. By the time you're, you're reading data fast enough out of, a, out of a RAM to do 1080p, you have two little interstitial gaps available to turn around and write the data. Yeah. Like, 
70 or 80 percent of your time is spent reading it just to generate the display. Yeah, you'd have to go back to something like I did with the RAM blade where you, your, your address and data um, are on separate pins and you're not multiplexing anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like if we could do, uh, well, for, for got these pins. Kinds, and for these kind of graphics, you need to do page flipping anyway. You know, you don't want to be showing what's happening during redraw. So if you had like two physically separate hyper RAMs, then you could you know, be on separate pin sets, reading from one while writing to the other. And that way you could get full write bandwidth. Yeah. I'm still not convinced that HyperM's gonna give you what you're after. Well, you know, the okay. nice thing is it, it looks like it's just 11 pins, which is mm. kind of attractive. That's not much. But what is, what's the latest price on a HyperM? Does anyone know? What does- I don't think pricing's an issue. About three to seven dollars, different sizes. Okay. So they're not. I don't think pricing pricing's not the issue. the The issue is getting a product that that will work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll maybe maybe in time we'll see. I'd like to see. I know Roglo has been working off and on on his Hyper RAM driver. I haven't noticed too much activity on that lately on the forum, but uh, he spent hundreds, I, I think probably hundreds of hours on that. Mm. Chip, going back a bit, when do you think you'll have this code evolved enough that you would share the source in case people want to port it? Well, it's shareable now. Um, you're looking at th two different things. There's some Delphi code and there's some assembly code. That assembly code could be rewritten into Delphi. You know, I don't know that there'd necessarily be that much of a speed hit. I just figured it was easy to do it in assembly because I already had all that infrastructure in place. But uh, it's really not that much. I mean, all you're doing is you're parsing, looking for keywords, for numbers, for strings, and for label names that, you know, the, the user has expressed already. And so you just need like a little hashed symbol table for the keywords and usernames. And then you just use algorithms to, to pull apart the uh, numerical values. There's re really very little to it. I mean, it's just a concept, you know, it's just a concept. Have any of you guys downloaded it already and tried it out? I did yesterday. Okay. I just, I, I, I just saw a few positive confirmations earlier today. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't see any, any, anything. Oh, let me do one more thing. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, no way. Okay. Here we are. Uh, can you see this up at the top? All of these screens, every one of these things, uh, you, you can set the position on, right? So if I want this terminal to appear at, at zero, uh, let's say zero 100, I can do that there. So see it moved down a little bit, but watch. As I grab it, Jeff helped me with this just like a couple hours before this presentation, but if you grab this window, and you drag it around, it shows, while you're dragging it, it shows the uh, coordinates. So if I wanna move it here, two comma 369, because here's the thing, if, if you've got a lot of these screens up, you're not gonna, you're, you're gonna prefer that Windows just doesn't throw them somewhere each time you open up, right? So, oh, wait a minute, was that, did I miss a number there? Oh, 369, 339. No, wait, two, one, I'll just say zero, 374. There it is. So you're gonna want to have your uh, debug windows arranged in some fashion on your desktop that's consistent and they kind of nest together nicely. 
I could try to make it so that as it opens windows, it, it puts them in, the, I'll probably eventually make it do that. But for the time being though, you can just put them, you know, it, it'll tell you where it's at. So if you have all your debug windows open, you move them into a position that you like, and then just enter those in as positions at the, uh, you know, the time you instantiate the display. And then you can have things set up consistently. So anyway, Ken, I don't know what else there is to talk about. Well, now we'll all start using it and then we'll have more to talk about. Any more questions out there? Uh, and, more, more kind of um, repeating what somebody else already said. It would be very nice if stuff like that is not included in peanut and included in, but kind of a single program. So just the, the demo window stuff and probably DLL because that could be loaded from other programs. So basically, let's say uh, Eric would be able to load that thing into FlexGUI and have the same demo windows like there are in the pop tool. Um, so kind of separated in different um, programs. I, I agree with you, Michael. I think it would be nice to have this available to FlexGUI, to Mu, to whatever, but I, I think it also has to be compiled so it can be cross-platform. Unless we use Windows only, which is fine, but it, there is reason to separate it out from the software, kind of like PST, isn't there? Yeah, right. like PST is a separate program and can be used uh, alone. And I think Probably if 90% is in Delphi, it should run with that free Pascal stuff. I mean, it shouldn't be that problematic and that is cross-platform. Well, I think you threw out a challenge. Let's see if somebody takes it. Chip, post your source code. <laughs> well, the trouble is I got to like part it out of everything else to make it I have to make it stand alone. Oh yeah, and then people and have I, to be able to sort through the uh, the x86 part as well, the assembly, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to, I don't know if people want to mess with that. I, I'd have to write that, rewrite that into Pascal or something. Um, but you know, I thought about this for like 25 years, that this would be nice to have something like this. And it always seemed like this, high in the sky thing and I finally just got into it and I think how long have I been working on it now Ken? Uh, three weeks. So in three weeks I got it I got all this stuff put together and it didn't really take that long I've had many three weeks in the past I guess I could have done this. No you do well with deadlines lately. Yeah. So we, we need the next day for him in six weeks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> next, next presentation. <laughs> Well, let's Chip use this. Yep. Go ahead. Chip, just post the chunks of code. We'll all get into converting it. You're saying just, just put the code out so you can see it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll put it up and uh, let's see. I wonder though, I'm trying to think of, there's all these little tentacles that feed back into other parts of the application. There's like the deep, there's the serial communication stuff. Um, it's, I, I don't know how much work it's gonna be for me to deliver something that stands alone, you know, so that it can be worked on without being everything. Don't bother with that. We'll just take the pieces of code and convert it. And then we'll okay, see well, yeah. how it hangs together. Okay, yeah, I, I, can, I can put the Delphi stuff together very quickly, but there will be some missing tentacles. It won't just compile, you understand? Yeah, yeah, that's but fine. The, but all the concept is there. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. I mean, the question is if free Pascal maybe also supports a assembler, and then you could run it at least on, on x86, and we can just try to compile the whole peanut thing with free Pascal. 
Mm-hmm. I, I think a big part, I think a big part of this is we've got to get everybody on the same page as far as what the protocol is going to be, which was something I said earlier. You know, if somebody wants to send, you know, 100 bytes of text and then, you know, uh, 128 samples because they're doing 16 channels and, and so on, and they're sending sample, they're sending blocks of however many samples, and they're doing an XY, you know, that's something that TCP IP does very well, but it just would suck the bandwidth and kill us. So it's the protocol that we're interested in, in efficiently adding and tear down channels when somebody wants to, you know, do an oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer, as you pointed out. On the propeller side, you just use an oscilloscope, and on the PC side, you say, oh, I want a bar graph for this instead of a, um, you know, a wiggly line. You know, you have to have the communication that says going back and forth that, uh, you know, I want five channels of audio and I want and I want and I'm doing some bitmap stuff and I need three text channels and no now I only need two and and I want my window over here and over there and it's like that's what we need when you're saying apparently you're like on the on the, on the spin side you're saying give me a 128 by 44 window with uh, with three oscilloscope channels you know because I'm monitoring XYZ servos you know and then and some text okay the protocol is what we need that so that everybody who starts getting into this thing and adding to it is going to be on the same page, um, you know, working whether it's flex GUI or whatever, you know, so that we have a lingua franca. I think that's what you've really accomplished. So yeah, give us the assembly stuff and uh, and the Pascal, and you know that way. Well, like I said, we're all on the same page. So Gerald, a question for you: If if Chip spent time then really fleshing out a good protocol, what does that mean for Rubidium software that you were showing your tool? Uh, the, the what it means is, um, I'm using Document View architecture, which is built, which has been around since the mid '90s in Microsoft Foundation class. So I can actually like open. Um, you know, five different music files. So if I implement a DJ controller and I want to have six turntables, it's already in my application. I only showed you one. I just click new window, new window, like I'm in Microsoft Word or Notepad and just keep launching apps. Okay, so I can have multiple windows, multiple views of multiple documents. Uh, it's a multi-document, multi-view, and all I did is, is just click on the boilerplate stuff in Visual Studio 2005 that long ago and said, I want this type of app. And what I'm doing is I'm switching between views or opening additional views. So I can have an oscilloscope view, a piano view, a spectrum analyzer view, an RGB view, an OpenGL view, all on the same document or multiple documents at the same time. And I was doing, I'm doing a lot of triple buffering, re-blitting, and checking background areas for update regions. And it was a lot of hair pulling for a long time to be able to have some, like an oscilloscope and a spectrum analyzer going at the same time. And then I tackled the memory problem, which is, okay, how am I going to get this to run on a, uh, on a propeller? And it's like, so I have to start looking at memory allocation and not having, you know, 80 megabytes of memory in a place where I only need 8,000 bytes and so where I can have objects sharing the same buffer and doing other things to really, really, really make it parsimonious so that the code base will eventually run on a microcontroller. It should eventually run. If I could do windowing right now by racing the beam, and I've seen some people have already doing that are already doing oscilloscopes. It's just a matter of being able to like add and tear down channels. You know, there's there's a big hurdle there of going from document view MFC architecture to a multi-windowed view. But apparently some people are accomplishing that where they're saying, well, you can do text and you can have different texts and you can have some some graphics and things going in different windows, sort of in a rudimentary way that other people are saying on their 1080 thing, 1080, where you don't actually need the whole two megabyte buffer, you can do some things. But then when you start moving windows around and we attach a uh, mouse, then I think people are going to want to have two propellers, one that's handling the um, one that's handling the um, the graphics, because if somebody is if somebody is debugging a robot, chances are the GUI is not necessarily going to be in the robot. Or you know, if the robot's got 500 virtual muscles, then we won't really 
we need eight propellers, okay? You know, depending on, you know, how we're, how people are using the channels. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I, and not to be presumptuous, I was wondering if you'd be bringing that to the, the propeller heads as well. Because I was thinking about my application, which is um, recognizing uh, pitch and tones. And I thought perhaps your tool would enable that a lot easier for me. Yeah, eventually my, well, eventually I have to think in terms of like revenue. I know there was a, uh, there was a propeller one scope. There was a prop one scope and, and people had to like, you know, buy the license or something. So I'm looking right. at eventually have a dual license model where I would like to be able to have like a professional level DSP tool chain. So somebody that needs like, you know, a Chevy Chev or a Butterworth filter or something and something and they're building because they're working for Boeing or Yamaha or Lockheed. So I can charge them up the yin yang and say, get out your checkbook, friends. This is MIT license. OK, and have it basically make something that's like 90 percent open source. So all the propeller heads can just, you know, play to their heart's content. But, you know, if you're making the, the DSP core for uh, 737 Max, you got to write me, a, you know, a big sum. So I'm, I'm looking at a dual I'm looking at eventually a dual license open source model. But I'm sort of where you are, where it's like I've got this thing that I need to tear out of something that I've been working on for 25 years. and you know, I want to get things working and it's like, you know, on the propeller side and like the whole A, A to D conversion thing, that was just heaven sent all the stuff that people were doing in bitstream tests and stuff. And, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking at having a piece of freeware that provides some substantial functionality and then have a value added. I know, I know other people are doing hardware like P2D2 or acrylic cases or something. I don't have something that's ready yet where I can just put it on GitHub and, and add a paywall if they want, a, you know, a value added feature like, you know, they want, uh, you know, to be able to transcribe sheet music on their phone or something, which something that's on a completely different code fork where my business model is protected, but I'm still giving people sure. something. Yeah, well, I like where you're going. And Hanno's, Hanno's debug tool is very popular as was uh, PLX DAC, a product we made with Marty Hebel that became, um, uh, maker plot, just these types of viewer programs, and it looks like what you have is a good pairing with the P2. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, if there's anything else here, next week we have um, smart pins, and John and Chip, you guys um, probably have plenty to talk about. Do you need any input on what people are interested in? in regards maybe, to smart oh, pins. John so maybe Tybus, we could just, yeah, tell Chip what we'd like to see out of the smart pin discussion for next week while we got his attention. Well, I think what would be helpful is kind of signal generating um, in detail. So because I think with scope and it would be a nice product to build a signal generator out of the Wizard P2. Wait, say that again, Michael? Kind of uh, what, my, what would be needed to build a nice signal, signal generator with a P2. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I was thinking, Chip, when you were showing the, the Gortzel boards, because I don't know what to use those for, but but if you had the ability to generate signals like Michael's suggesting and that, you could turn the P2 into a neat digital theremin. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, what, what is possible with all this Wurzel stuff, we've just scratched the surface of. You know, we made this little board that you can run your finger over because it's kind of a, kind of a simple way to show it doing something, but there are, in this latest silicon, there are a lot of, uh, you can have up to four Gortzel input channels that correlate to your, you know, potentially four outputs, and you can add and subtract them. You could discount them, ignore, you know, ignore them, or bring them in positive or as negative and sum them together before doing your, uh, your you know, multiply accumulates for sine and cosine. So we haven't even, figured what we could do with that, but I, I know it's got to be useful for something.
So there's all kinds of development that can go on that goes into areas we don't even really know about yet. So, so a function generator would be useful. Well, I'd like to see some simple examples, Chip, of just setting PWM, like for servos and. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, and how to operate them. All that stuff's designed to be kind of run on interrupts. I mean, you, you can use interrupts to maintain all that stuff in the background. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, like a spin program where you have a couple lines of code and it just updates the pin to do right. different things. I think people would like to see those simple examples. All right. Yeah, for robotics, for sure, PBM and quadrature encoding or decoding in this case. Okay, so um, next week then, um, yeah, John Titus will join us. Thanks, and there is a draft document. We'll see if we can get Chip's eyes on that documentation before our meeting. And then in September, after Jeff and uh, Michael present, we, we are out of presentations again. So um, that's a ways away. We don't have to really fill it until the time draws near, but if anybody has ideas, they wanna bounce around. I'm happy to discuss them. Or you could just sign up and throw yourself out there. And I did not schedule the free for all yet because these other topics popped in, but maybe we will do the free for all meet and greet on a Tuesday. So we don't, we can add to our regular presentation schedule. That sounds okay with people. I see Michael's mm -hmm. nodding his head, so. Great. Now, if you guys have any ideas for how to enhance the uh, debug stuff, you know, as far as like new display types, just post it on the forum and I, I'm interested. I mean, I've got this thing set up now that I think I can add in whole new display types within like a half hour or something if it's not very complex. So I've got all the little infrastructure in place and I've got the framework in which it all goes together. So it's gonna be very easy to add new display modes. Chip, it may be going a little bit over the top, but uh, based on somebody's comment, uh, they were talking about maybe doing, a, you know, like an analog voltmeter type thing. Would it be possible, since you're running it on a PC, to have a window, when it opens, suck in a bitmap file that it uses as the background and then draw? Yeah, it? yeah. I was thinking of that. See, that's the, the, the thing about having the PC at your disposal. You can do things that would just be stupid on the chip itself. So it's like we can save bitmaps, of course. We can load bitmaps into the background. And I was thinking it might even be good to like add one more layered bitmap, which is the background. So for things like uh, some scopes and whatnot, the background, once it's set up, it's static. If it's anything complex, it might be good to have saved on a bitmap that you copy onto your working bitmap and then draw over and then copy again forward to the thing that then goes onto the canvas. So yeah, we, we, could, we could pull in bitmaps. That's, I, it had crossed my mind and we could do that. You know, again, getting back to that kind of analog meter looking display, I don't know if it makes sense, but perhaps you have a display type that's a needle where you have a, an or yeah. the needle, a length of the needle, and you give it a range and then anytime you give it a value, it'll just draw that line where right. it's to in right. the display. So that way you could get really nice analog displays, you know, because people like those sometimes. Yep. Yeah. No, we could we could do that. We could even have a little uh, bitmap of a nice analog meter that you uh, load in as the background. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm also interested in what Cluso brought up, which is uh, what would it take to port this to VGA or HDMI? 
display. Well, the prop could do it. I mean, the beauty of having the prop do it is you don't have to go through any kind of protocol, right? There's no serializing data. You just give it the data and it, it maps it how it needs to. So it's hundreds of times faster. Oh, I hear an open object up for grabs. <laughs> Let me just uh, chime in here for a minute if I can. You're talking about uh, tester instruments. One little instrument that I've had good luck with is manufactured by analog devices. It's the ADALM2000, and they call it the Active Learning Module. And this is a really nice device. It's not terribly expensive. It would be, it acts as a signal generator. It can generate SPI and I square C, and it also can receive them. It's got uh, A to D, D to A converters, and it's a pretty nice little tool. It was aimed more at uh, college kids who are uh, in EE labs or uh, engineering fundamental labs or courses. It's, it's just something that, you know, if you want something external to the prop tool for debugging and testing, particularly if you're trying to interest of kids and things. They can see things very graphically without doing a lot of programming. This is a pretty nice device to take a look at. So again, I'll hold it up here just so you see the number. ADALM2000. I don't know what it costs. I, I think this one cost me about $100. Maybe it's uh, less or more than now than that. It comes with the uh, standard 10th uh, inch pin connectors and a bunch of these uh, adapters come with it as well. So it's pretty easy to hook up. It's a very nice device. Hooks up via USB and worth taking a look at. Cool. Yeah, Mauser sells them for 162 bucks. Is that what it is? Yeah, see, yeah. And now we have a new product for the P2. <laughs> <laughs> well, there must be some kind of like does this plug into some kind of like a signal workbench or something? Uh, yes, it does. The analog devices has code for it, and I forget what they call it, but it's on my PC, and I run it quite often. It's pretty nice. You can choose the instrument or instruments you want to use and connect it up, and it'll display waveforms. It lets you create waveforms. Uh, it's just really a nice general purpose piece of test apparatus. Particularly if you if you have a small workbench and you don't have a big, you know, a big scope handy or a separate logic analyzer handy, it's kind of an all-in-one instrument. Again, it was, I'm sure, made for the educational market, but uh, I found it very useful in the lab. Yeah, and that that brings up the point: we should do things that um, customers need, not just things that are cool. Because sure. here's a device that gives gives us our signals and shows them already. That'd be a nice demo app for the P2 as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Chip. You gave us a lot to talk about, obviously, this time. Yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Chip. Mm -hmm. All right, well, ha have a, a great day in Oz and a good night in Europe. And, um, dinner for the rest of us and we'll get this up on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right. Bye-bye.